Okay, we're recording now. Okay. Okay, so welcome to the um, meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Internet Society. This is meeting number 140. And uh, we have posted the agenda um, that I guess Kevin will post it now into Zoom. Yes. Okay, perfect. So that's our, our agenda. Um, first of all, we received um, regrets from a few trustees, but nevertheless, we have you know quorum. So we have uh, seven voting trustees, if I count it correctly. And um, any declaration of conflicts taking into account the agenda that we should note? Um, I don't see all the videos, so if somebody has something, please talk to me now. Um, yeah, now I see you. So no, no conflict of interest, right? Okay, excellent, perfect. So that was the, the first point. So as you know, it's our tradition, and, and I think also it's in the bylaws that we have a meeting before, before the AGM so that we can actually you know, approve the reports from, from the different committees to basically you know, convey the action points to the next board and basically you know, agree on, on a few or make a few formal decisions so that you know, they are made before we get to, to the AGM, which in this case is in two weeks in, in Panama. So let's get started with the agenda. The first um, you know, item we have, which is point two in the agenda, is to document the resolutions approved by eVote since, since the last time. And we don't have any to pass any resolution, but John, you want to comment on that? Yeah, the, these are seven resolutions that, uh, that we've passed since last fall. And uh, due to clerical sloppiness by me, se several of them should have, been, sh should have been included in the minutes earlier. But it's, it's just a clerical thing. I mean, they were, they've been valid since, they've, since they were passed. We just, hadn't, we just haven't published them yet. And I'm now, Kevin and I now have a spreadsheet, so we should, we should, we should be able to fix this problem. Okay. Excellent. Perfect. So those are the resolutions and they are captured in the agenda. So as, as we said, I mean, the resolutions have been approved already. This is just a documentation matter. So we don't have any, any resolution related, related to approving those. Excellent. So moving along to point number three in the agenda, which is the actionable items that we want to transfer from this board to, which is you know, the 2017-2018, to the next board, which will be appointed at the IGM, AGM in two weeks, and it's the 2018-2019 board. So, um, Kathy, you want to introduce the resolution? Uh, certainly. <clears throat> this uh, resolves to uh, ensure that this board is uh, letting the next board know its intention with respect to three uh, of the large programmatic areas. One would be the continuation of the 2018 plan, which as you know, goes through the end of the year. Uh, continuation of um, the intent to, um, to run and fund the uh, ISOC new foundation. Um, and thirdly, to support the um, IATA 2.0 um, uh, process that's going on. So what this does, it says this board intends to do that and is basically asking the other board to accept this as a board decision. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, Kevin is showing the, the resolution and the, if you scroll up a bit, yeah, there. That's the resolution that we are um, passing and, and the summary of the agreed action items for, for the next board. Okay. So the resolution haven't been introduced. I need someone to, to move the resolution. Hans Peter moves and Harry seconds. So we're gonna do this by raising hands. Yeah, thanks Kevin for moving into mosaic mode. So we're gonna be voting yes, no, and abstain. So, you know, first yes, all trustees voting yes, please raise your hands. Um, um, thank you, trustees voting no. Raise your hands. Okay, nobody. And trustees um, abstaining, raise your hands. Okay, so the resolution passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, now we are moving to the part of the agenda where we accept the different reports that they have been produced. So we have you know, the elections committee, governance, the auditor report, the audit committee, the finance committee, and then the president and CEO report. So we will start with the election committee report. Um, Hiroshi was chairing that committee, but unfortunately couldn't join us. So Hans Peter will be presenting these for him. So Hans Peter, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, Kevin, could you project? 
the slides or the text prepared by Horoshi. Okay, here we are. Uh, the election committee report can be a rather short report because nothing uh, out of uh, border has happened during uh, the process. Everything was run smoothly and without uh, larger incidents. I'm not sure if you want to hear all, all details who was uh, selected and not selected or better read it up. I think everything is nicely captured in this report and reading it down is really uh, a waste of, a little bit of waste of time. So I'm happy to just present it as it was. There was no challenges, uh, no special things to do. It went forward. Uh, we had no big problem. Uh, we had no problems with uh, the election system. Uh, the only point which perhaps should be uh, a little bit standing out, uh, we tried to have some kind of discussion between candidates and uh, uh, the public, uh, and we didn't succeed in having, let's say, any substantial uh, discussion on any topics. Uh, there were some uh, initial questions uh, which were answered by the candidates or which were answered by at least most of the candidates, but uh, there were no additional remarks, topics, discussion or so on, which were really valid. On the other hand, we had no uh, bad things written into the pool either, so it was simply calm or completely silent. Okay, that's more or less all to the report. I have not to report much more. Thank you, Hans Peter. Maybe, maybe just to stress the fact that the chapter selected Walid and the organizations uh, elected um, uh, Robert Pepper, Pepper. Pepper. just for, for completeness, exactly. And, and you and uh, Sean were re-elected by the IETF. True, yeah, the IAB reappointed yeah, both uh, Sean and myself. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, for completeness, that's a very good point. So that means that the, the next board, we will have Alice leaving and Pepper joining. So that will be the, the change in terms of voting trustees. Excellent, thank you, Hans-Peter. So we have a resolution to accept that report and I need someone... Oh, yeah. uh, usually I move it as one who brought it in, so... Absolutely, yep. Hans-Peter, I was expecting that. So Hans-Peter moves, anyone seconds? I see Glenn seconds. Okay, Glenn, thank you. So the same, the same, uh, yes, Glenn, you want to say something? No, you are muted. Uh, okay, just testing my audio. Is that okay? It works perfectly. Yes. Please okay. Some, sometimes I sound like a mouse. Um, <laughs> I, I want to acknowledge the the um, Olga uh, for the excellent work she did on the nomination committee. A uh, lot of hard work. We did get a bit of blowback because it ended up uh, we got criticism because we didn't have a female candidate. But we, I think, we did more than enough with with. Um, Arish with uh, two of the three being candidates for PAR. So I think we did the best we could. So uh, I think it was great to get as many people uh, interested as possible. So it, it went very well. So it was uh, a little bit of hard work, but uh, I think uh, everybody should be proud of their work. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the elections are, are kind of, you know, successful if the nomination process is it's, uh, successful. And yeah, this year we, we had a good nomination process with, with a lot of interest. So that was, that was absolutely a, a great thing. Thanks for bringing it up, Glenn. Okay, perfect. So now we're going to do the same thing, uh, raising hands. You know, you can vote yes, no, or abstain. So everyone voting yes, please raise your hands. Um, everybody voting no, please raise your hands. Everybody abstaining, please raise your hands. So the resolution passes unanimously. Um, you know, I, I don't fully understand the symbols you guys are doing with the fingers, but, but you know, um, I will count only hands up or hands down <laughs> for your information. Um, moving on to point number five in the agenda, which is the governance, governance Committee report. And again, Hans-Peter will introduce it. So Hans-Peter, the floor is again yours. So uh, this one is even shorter because uh, I have no written report so far because the governance committee has nothing big to report. Uh, we committed our time to discuss some of the intro uh, introduced open points and more or less tabled them all. Though uh, what I will do is uh, write a letter to the incoming next uh, 
governance committee as it done usually and listing the open points and uh, pointing to things which has to be changed for one of the things we want to slightly modify the way elections are done by not allowing uh, having uh, different uh, uh, people to apply as well as uh, org member as uh, chapter member, so uh, slight uh, accommodation. And this letter has been written this year from the governance committee and it has to be adjusted and redone next year. So nothing major to report and uh, yeah, uh, a lot of things discussed, but no real production output. So yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Hans-Peter. Yeah, and I know that, I mean, all trustees are very interested in, in what the governance committee will be working on next year. So. So that's great that you have, you know, planned the, the, the handover type of, you know, process. Excellent. So, Hans-Peter, do you want to move? Yeah, yeah I have to. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, Hans-Peter. Hans-Peter moves. Anyone seconds? Um, Harris seconds, I guess. Okay, perfect. So the same process as before. Um, raise your hands if you are voting yes, please. Okay, um, voting no, please raise your hand. And abstaining, please raise your hands. Okay, the resolution passes unanimously. Thank you. And thank Hans-Peter for, for introducing both um, reports. And moving on to point number six in the agenda, which is the independent auditor's report. And, you know, the chair of the audit committee, Mr. John Levin, is going to introduce it. So, John, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to say the, the audit report is several pages long, but it can be summarized as saying everything is fine. The auditor, the auditors said they were happy with it, happy with everything in it. Uh, San, Sandy and the committee went over it and we all agree. So I, I encourage, I encourage us to adopt it. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. Any, wow. any, any questions? Okay, good. Then uh, John, do you want to move? I guess I do. Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. Any, any one seconds? The motion, the series seconds. Thank you. So again, the same routine. We're going to do raise our hands. So, you know, trustees voting yes, please raise your hand. Trustees voting no, please raise your hands. Okay. And trustees voting abstain, please raise your hands. Okay. So this resolution passes unanimously. Excellent. Um, good. Um, um, Kevin, I'm thinking that you may want to ping Todd at some point because we may be ready before 15 to the hour. So just, you know, uh, logistics. Yep. I'll point. do that. I'll do that. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, excellent. So that was point number six in the agenda. Um, point number seven in the agenda is related to that, which is the audit committee report. And again, you know, the chair of our audit committee is John. So please, John, could you please introduce the... Yeah, um, I, I, I finally sent out the... Um, the uh, audit committee report Wednesday afternoon after we had our final meeting was while 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 waiting in line to have lunch. Okay. And the yeah and the, and the audit committee the, the only thing that's slightly interesting about the audit committee report is that uh, last year we had a plan to to create an internal um, risk management risk management process and risk risk management committee. Um, our auditors helped design one with a beautiful color map of sort of here's the dangerous stuff and here's the defensive stuff, which we can go over in more detail if you want. But we, we all looked at it with them and with Sandy, and then we encouraged Sandy to uh, put together a, a, tr a, a charter for the, for the staff committee, which we then, which we then approved. So, uh, <clears throat> so that, that, is, uh, that, that is underway. And I'll, I guess I'll, I'll ask Sandy, anything else, anything else you want to say about that? Uh, no, I mean, we, yes, it's underway and we're, um, we're getting the charter together. We're getting some staff training together um, and other items. So it, it is certainly uh, underway in yeah. 2018. Okay. Yeah. And other than, that, other than that, it's the usual stuff. And we do have updated conflict of interest from all of the board members. So everybody can come to the AGM. Okay. Excellent. You, you got all of us, right? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, there was, there, was, there was some question about Desiree, but that's all, that's all sorted out. We, we, we got them all. Excellent, excellent. Glad to hear. Perfect. Thank you very much for introducing the report then. And do you want to move? So moved. Okay. Um, who seconds? Hans-Peter seconds. Okay. So again, the same routine. Uh, trustees voting yes, please raise your hands. Uh, trustees voting no, please raise your hands. Trustees voting abstain, please raise your hands. Um, 
Desiree, I didn't see you raising your hand. You voted yes? Ah, okay, so I, I had missed you. Sorry, yes. Okay, excellent, thanks. Uh, sometimes the mosaic is, is not so clear. Um, you know, if the video freezes, I, I may lose some, some hand. Okay, perfect, so the resolution then passes unanimously. Excellent. So mm -hmm. this is good. Um, we are moving on to point number eight on the agenda, another, yet another report, which is the Finance Committee report, and our treasurer, um, Sean, is gonna introduce that. So Sean, please go ahead. All right, hey, <clears throat> so you would've saw this uh, late last night or early this morning. Um, just kinda wanted to summarize what we've done. Uh, I listed the committee members, which is myself as the chair, uh, Richard Barnes, Kathy Brown as ex officio, non-voting, Gonzalo, uh, Olga and Hans-Peter. We held a number of meetings uh, this year and all of the meetings we meet for a particular purpose to go over, um, you know, budgeting type things or other things that pop up. Um, I guess I also wanted to let everybody know that Sandy and I do also talk in, even more because um, there's lots of stuff that pops up and just so that she keeps me aware and so I'm not surprised. And we're doing this RFP process for the um, um, investment advisors and so we blocked off an entire week to try to um, interview with them but it looks like it might all happen on one day so that'll be nice um, okay so the basic summary of the financial health of the internet side is we're in pretty good shape um, basically uh, in 2017 we were able to uh, you know fit within the 39 million dollar financial envelope that we had um, we had a deficit of about $82,000, which kind of really wasn't a big deal, but it was mostly based on lower than anticipated active sponsorship and registration re revenue. But uh, this was offset by lower than budgeted spending of, for personnel and operating costs. Um, but, you know, in, in the market, uh, in Europe, they can't seem to make any money in the investment market. In the U.S., we made <laughs> $9 million. Um, and I guess I should note that, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about the increase in revenue that we're going to get from the, you know, the finalization of the PR backend provider contract coming through. We're not really going to start to see that till 2018. Um, the no look, notable exception of that, though, was the $40 million sweep from their reserves to ours. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, then I kind of want to hit like the big funds that we take care of. The first one is the continuity fund. Um, which is, you know, to make sure if it's a rainy day and we don't have any money, what to do. Uh, basically, in 2017, we gained 11.4%, uh, which beat all the strategic indices that we were, were uh, modeled against. So it's up to 18.6 million um, as, at the end of the year on December 31st, 2017. Um, and at the end of this quarter, it's, it's, it has, it's kind of flattened out. It's about 18.5 million. Um, and what we do when we talk with the investment advisors is talk with them about, you know, what if any changes we should kind of make. And we basically just decided to kind of play a little bit within the actual allocation tables that we're allowed to have. So basically we're making no changes. Um, and as a result of the resolution to get the, to set the amount that we wanted to have in the continuity fund, which is 16 million, um, we've decided to just kind of leave it alone and just let it run. Um, okay, so the next big fund is the ITF Endowment Fund. Um, uh, there's really only, the only real contributions this year were from Ripe. They made a multi-year commitment to put in about 110 euros, and that came. Um, and, but, but again, the fund has grown from, um, I think, 15% after fee, so it went from 2.17 to 2.6, um, which is pretty good. And as of March 31st, the balance is 2.6 million. Um, and basically, again, we reviewed the investment portfolio and, and the, so, the, the risk yes. market. So we left uh, it alone. You said they put 110 euros. I assume it's 110,000 euros. Yeah, it's 110,000 euros. You're correct. <laughs> Good. <laughs> There's a K in there. I just missed it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the, the last and fun one is always the special non-recurring fund. This is the $10 million that we got from PIR back in like 2014. And we, we, we keep kind of like, you know, talking about it and spending it. And we're finally getting to the point where we are. So of the $10 million they gave us, 3.37 um, million remained at the end of December, 2017. Um, and we got 1.86 million now at the end of March. That's because we decided to give the 500K for the diamond and security stuff. And also the $1 million um, for the IASA 2.0 transition got out of there, came out of that bucket. So eventually we'll finally, you know, drain that, that money down to its end. 
Um, okay, so on to staff and process. Basically, nothing has really changed with the staff. Sandy, Sandy and Co. are still running the ship down there. Um, and we're going to part, we're basically kind of following the same process that we did last year um, for this year's budget. Um, PR interest, uh, PIR uh, interactions. I know that Sandy and company has interactions down there and I have interactions with Jeff and we're basically going to kind of continue to have those meetings to just, uh, you know, make sure there's goodwill. And so there's no, no major surprises on the, on the horizon. Um, okay. So for financial advice going forward, we obviously still have this huge, you know, amount of money that we get from PIR and, and, you know, the finance committee, I think rightly so thinks that there should be a way to try to, look out and find other sources so that we can kind of spread things out with the way we've set up the foundation the isaac foundation i think there's less of that concern for that but i still don't think that we should rest on our laurels um because who knows maybe dot org goes poof next week and then we're in a big big band of trouble so i think it's it's just we're just doing our due diligence by looking looking out for other things um I think that uh, one of the other things was the trend was revenues versus expenses. And you know, in the past, the board is you know, really concerned that the expenses were going faster than revenues. That's not really true now, but since we have, we're gonna have more money, I think we need to make sure we don't fall back into that. So um, I think we just have to make sure that we monitor you know, the things that we're spending our money on so that we're not kind of overshooting the, the, the money that's on its way in. And we have a couple of recommendations for the next finance committee. Um, which were the same as the ones from last year. Uh, continue to process, um, continue the process used successfully for the development of the annual budget over the past few years. Work with the board um, to develop goals for the IITF endowment and, and how it'll work with IASA 2.0 and to continue joint meetings with the PIR finance team. <clears throat> okay, good. Um, Hans, Hans Peter had a question on the chat. So if you could check that regarding the RFP. Uh, just a micro uh, it's, it's uh, you, you talked about one week for the RFP, uh, but you wrote a little more than one month. Uh, so yeah, so the idea is that the RFP has been, <coughs> excuse me, is out and running. And what we're doing is that week is basically where we're going to be interviewing the final candidates. So Sandy and I are going to sit in a room and get uh, okay. you know, so, and uh, feed to death by them. Uh, I wanted to know how many liquid lunches I could have in this one day period. I thought we clearly needed to spread this out. Now, Kathy's giving me the no. So, um, you know, so it'll just be one day and we'll do it and then we'll, we'll report back. Because we have, because the idea is that we also have an advisor with us helping. So, because like if they told me it's one penny versus 10, like I probably wouldn't know. So the nice thing about having this independent person who um, kind of has a sense of the fees we, we can kind of get a better feeling for what's what's good and what's not. Good, excellent. Any any other questions for Sean? <clears throat> um, okay, good. So Sean, would you like to move? I would like to move to put this in the, in the minutes. Okay, and approve the resolution. Excellent. Yes. Um, anyone seconds? I have Harish seconds. Okay, so again, the same procedure, you know, raise your hands if you want to vote yes. Okay, um, raise your hand if you want to vote no. And raise your hand if you want to abstain. Okay, the resolution passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sean, for preparing the, the comprehensive report. That was, that was useful. useful. Um, Glenn, do you want, yes. Uh, on the investment, do we have a screen to, to make sure that um, any of the investments are ethical investments, like whether green or non-tobacco or, or any, any, do we have any kind of, of a screening process on not just the rate of return, but uh, the investment is in ethical companies? So maybe Sandy or Sean, you so want yeah, to I can, Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. We have um, put our money into what's called ESG um, funds. And as we go through the RFP process, that's one of our focus as well. Um, as we move to potentially a new investment manager, um, we're looking for those investment managers that have experience in this and not just starting that process now. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Thanks. And we did that. We actually did that last year. Yes, and it's funny because yes, yes. it, as it turns out, the ones we moved into the, the you know green funds actually returned better than the other ones. Yeah. Yes, they, they do. do. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Yeah. But it was uh, just to be fully clear, 
not all of them got moved because some of them there were no ratings in the space so we just left them alone and as as the ratings get applied to more and more of them then we then we start to look at and say okay we are going to pick those yeah. but as he said the 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 new rfp process they're going to hear that up front like okay this is an overarching thing that you guys have to provide to us go from right. there yeah, I guess it gets back to the fact that we're not investing in any kind of military uh, armaments or anything of that nature. Well, indeed, if I may, um, and so, Glenn, you're totally right, because there are some of these investment funds, you don't actually know where the, where the investment is going. And mm -hmm. Sandy and I have discussed this at length to ensure that we tell them that there are things that we don't want. So they've got to be very careful. So, so there's things we want, the socially beneficial funds that are working yeah. and there are things yeah. we don't want, which is yeah. in the mix of something, you know, where we are supporting something that is not in, in line with our values. Now we got to be kind of clear uh, about the limits there. And that's a good discussion to have when this RFP comes in. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's it. Thank you, Glenn. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Because this, this, yeah, we, we decided some time ago and it's, it's good to point it out in the, in the session. Okay, any, any more questions for, for Sean or Sandy or, or regarding the financials? Excellent, thank you. So moving along to point number nine in the agenda, which uh, is, you know, Kathy will give us the, the CEO report. So, you know, Kathy, please go ahead. So I thought I would do, um, I thought I would just talk for a couple of minutes on the fact that we've been in a transition mode and divide that into two pieces. One, getting ready for the actual transition of the CEO. And secondly, just how this, how staff has been reacting over this period. Uh, as a first matter, um, we have a, a, a staff team together, uh, head by Greg Wood, that's putting together a briefing for the eventual uh, new CEO that would walk that person through a lot of the processes, procedures, what's going on and where. Um, my experience when I came in was I got like binders full of books and like it's like it's, it's overwhelming, you know, there's such and and long lectures about what it, what the IOC was and all this. So we decided to perhaps be a little bit more progressive here and have an online version of something that has some nice hyperlinks in it so that you could go, you know, sort of high and then deep. And I think um, because I believe we're in quite good shape around where much of these materials are now, thank you Hans Peter and others, that we are going to be able to um, provide that kind of navigation in this kind of briefing. If this comes out as well as I hope it will, this might be something for the whole board that you, you'd want to um, make use of. And we can think about how that might be used. Um, so I'm, I have not yet seen the first draft, although I have seen a very good outline and I feel quite good that this is underway and will be ready at the appropriate time. Any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we, we were doing exactly the same this year with you know, Kevin's help on, on producing materials for the new chairs of the committees because that was a, 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 an issue we identified that the chairs of the new committees, they sometimes they didn't have the necessary background. So we are doing roughly the same there. So when, I mean, we may get inspiration on how to do things from, from that. So that, that will be even, I, I mean, just to say that I agree with you that can be useful for the board as well. Good, and I feel quite good that Greg Wood has got his arms around this um, uh, together with um, Todd's staff who are, are um, pretty uh, sharp on now where things can be found and how we can easily find them and have them available. So I actually feel very good about that. Now turning to, uh, I wait your directions on the actual person, the actual time, the actual you know things we do, but in terms of getting the material together, I think we're, we're um, on the right set. In terms of the staff, um, um, kind of integration of work and transition. I couldn't, I, I couldn't describe a better situation. And really the key to this has been, we've had a lot, to, a lot of work to do. 
And because we have a fairly detailed uh, 2018 uh, plan that has milestones in it, uh, that we have uh, organized ourselves into these campaigns that you will hear in when we get to Panama is, is proving to be quite successful, a successful approach. Um, staff is very busy and they are producing uh, at high levels over this year and don't have a lot of time for worrying on the one hand. Secondly, I think they have high confidence in this board that things will move along. There's always, of course, you know, the backdrop and there's always, of course, the rumor mill and all of that, but it's really been kept to a minimum, I think. And I think you will be happy when you see the major issues that you just uh, um, targeted for your new board uh, that are the major, the, the, the major accomplishments we have to get done by the end of the year, uh, both in the uh, action uh, uh, plan, the IASA issues, and in the foundation, uh, that these things are well along and well developed. Uh, so we will have further plans, uh, further presentations on that for you in the next weeks uh, at, the, at the Panama board meeting, so I won't go into it there. There are internal kinds of improvements that we have been working on, the AMS system, thank you, I'm here one more time. We're actually out now for um, uh, the contract, I think is about to be signed. We're going to move forward on, on that. Um, we've uh, got a lease and a um, build out in our new offices in Reskin that I hope all of you will actually come to a meeting there so you see what a cool thing this is. Um, we're calling this a, um, a collaborative uh, uh, center rather than an office because it's smaller, frankly. There's um, lots of um, kind of uh, open space, but there's also offices that can be used, etc. We move into that office in two weeks time, or next week, I believe we actually do the physical move. Similarly, in, in uh, Geneva, we will move out of the current office into one that looks like we're kind of about to uh, put an offer on that's not far away from the current Geneva office, makes all the staff happy, but will also be smaller uh, and will also be around this kind of collaborative hub idea. Both of these together will not increase our costs. In fact, um, the move in uh, the move in Virginia brings it down a lot. Geneva is another whole story. Sometimes um, the costs of doing business in Geneva is something that one should probably do some um, some good analysis on. But for now, that is our headquarters, and we're making that move. So, all in all, I would say that both the work of the Internet Society is going on apace and that the internal um, kind of um, projects that we committed to are also on schedule and we will have a much more full report on that when we get to Panama. The, uh, the, the other big issue that you know that we've been working on is, um, is this membership piece and Todd's here to talk about that. Um, going forward, um, we know that you, the board, have a board retreat um, the week of, I think it's September 20th or 14th, is that it? 15-16, um, September. 15, 16. The staff has also, as we traditionally do, have an all-staff meeting planned for the week of the 25th or 26th, I believe, of September that we're calling a meetup. Uh, a staff meetup, a little bit different agenda than the last time, last two times, which is much more kind of big picture. The idea here is that there is a lot of work to be done and the staff needs to get together and that the timing would be absolutely correct, we would hope, for a new CEO to be introduced to the whole of the staff at that point and the old CEO to have a nice dinner and be able to say, um, everybody at one time so that we can have the continuity and the coherence we want for the organization. So that's something to know about and to look forward to and to have any input you might want to have on that. Um, uh, Raul is actually uh, heading that effort to, to get that meeting put together and so that's underway. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, sounds great. Um, regard yeah, regarding your comment about having trustees visiting the office, we were talking about that 
And the option of having the retreat, not this year, which is in Montevideo, but next year in, in Reston around September was getting some traction. So, I mean, we will obviously decide this in the AGM in, in a couple of weeks, but anyway, that's one of the options on the, on the table. I can tell you, Virginia is beautiful in September, so you, can, okay. you might think about it. Excellent, excellent, perfect. Um, any comments, um, questions for Kathy? Uh, Desiree, please. Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, ask um, what was the rationale for uh, moving the, uh, getting a new office in Geneva? Was the space too big or uh, what was our motivation? Actually, this space is, is kind of small and as you know, it's a little bit uh, broken up into three floors and, the, and there's no air conditioning nor would the, um, the uh, landlord provide it. And the landlord was just not open at all to doing some of the changes we needed done. They, I think they really have some other, some other use for that thing that they're looking at. And so the decision was made to look elsewhere and see if we could get, um, you know, Todd's here, he's done all this himself but see if we could get a space that we could design the way we want to design it on one floor. And that looks like that. Great. Uh, we did a lot of work with staff to make sure that they didn't feel like they were being displaced from a neighborhood that everybody feels very comfortable in. Mm -hmm. yep, Todd, thank Todd, you. Todd, Todd was pointing out in the chat room that the lease was anyway ending by the end of the year. So, okay. Um, I think Hans Peter had a question. Hans Peter. Yes, uh, you didn't mention where the all staff meetup will be happening. Is it oh, a virtual one perfect. or a real one? Panama. So we have actually, there'll be, a, it's a place not far from the airport that's like a compound kind of place. No fancy business here, just a, a, a pretty central place from a cost point of view is the lowest cost for us to fly people in, get a place, etc. So this is the third one we have done and we've kept it within the budget we've done it. Okay, good. Any any more questions? Excellent. Okay, thank, thank you, you Kathy. Um, yeah, we, we don't need a resolution here, so thanks thanks for the report. That was that was useful. Um, so now at this point, I think we can move that 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 completes the or concludes the you know blog we had for reports. So we have accepted a bunch of reports and then got then, you know, Kathy's report. And now moving on to, to a different point, which is point number 10 in the agenda, which is um, the update on organizational membership 2.0, um, driven by Todd. So Todd is going to give us a, a status update. So Todd, please. Good day, all. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Loud and clear. Thank you. Um, thank you for the time. Uh, I'm, I do have, uh, I think you've all received it already, but I, I do have a, a short, what I hope to be a very short PowerPoint to show you and just kind of talk through this. Um, I think you all recognize um, all of this information as, as uh, we've talked about it on a couple of occasions so far. Um, I'll preface anything I'm about to say with um, it's not only been, it's been one of the highlights of working at the Internet Society to get to work on this with this team. Um, to take a very complex thing that is this uh, membership of the organization and fundraising and all of that. And so to be able to pull it apart and think about it and, and put it back together in a way that I think um, meets the values of the organization has been, you know, maybe fun's the wrong word, but it, it has been a, a challenge and been something that I'm very interested in and how an organization like this works. So enough with my, uh, my preface there. So just to follow up with you, what you all asked me to do and, and what we've gone off and done. So your request in our March meeting was to confer with the community as we do, talk about what it is we want to do and gather their feedback. So we went out, we contacted directly all 150, it's, I think it's actually in the 149 uh, level, but 150 members, inviting them to a one-to-one -one conversation. This wasn't sent out via blast email or anything like that we uh, spoke to them or tried to speak to them one-to-one -one and then gathered data based on a few questions, a uh, very small presentation and then a few questions back. Um, the results this time were not as good as the first time we asked for the community to get involved. Part of them said, look, we did this with you. We, we told you what we wanted. If you're telling us, if you're going to tell us that you're going to do that, we're good. <laughs> But we, have, we did have 31 organizations, and you can see the breakout, 23 from what normally has been our uh, 
membership and eight from the OTA. We had those conversations. We collected that feedback and um, uh, put together this plan. Excuse me, Todd. Uh, if you're if you're going through this page by page, you'll have to give me a verbal cue. Oh, I'm, I thought I was sharing it, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, maybe you are. <laughs> How's that working for people? It, it was working fine for me. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I wasn't seeing it. How about now? Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Right. Sorry about that, Cross Kim. Um, so what we, uh, let's see here. I was, I was a slide before that. So um, the general overview was our results were mixed. Um, and, and it depended. I think we could put some very you know, thick lines in the spreadsheet of uh, differences between OTA, our foundational members, what level of membership they were, and then those who felt like the benefits truly were benefits or not. But the majority view was the proposed plan makes sense and is generally supported. So I, I put in here just some of the things that we heard. First on the strengths, always start with the positive, as they say. Um, harmonizing voting rights, that seemed interesting to most everyone in there that, that you know, one, one organization, one vote as it pertains to our governance. Um, the benefits of engagement, publications, information and communications are already being felt and appreciated. We've brought people in on our community networks here with a round table just recently. Um, our IG uh, internet governance campaign is doing the same thing. We are engaging with the community. We are asking their opinion. We're asking them to get involved. And most importantly, we're asking them to be advocates with us and figure this out. Um, most uh, uh, realize this idea of a diversity of geography, corporates, and nonprofits, and the size of the organization is a very welcomed approach. And then those in the middle tiers um, said, and when I say middle tiers, I mean in the silver range, uh, you know, the 10, uh, 10 to $20,000 range, those folks said, you know, increasing the, the uh, dues by a certain amount is fine with us. We just need a heads up to it so that we can put it in our budget. And then um, we've had some success with going to new organizations for membership and talking about our new benefits and selling them or talking to them, proposing to them at the $20,000 uh, mark. And you'll see some other data here in a minute. We currently have over 90 organizations in our pipeline for presentations and proposals. Now, that's a pipeline, and obviously that gets uh, uh, comes down smaller as we go through it. But with, with really two events that we've gone to and talked to people, to have that many already who have said, "Hey, I'm interested in hearing more," is is fairly uh, speaks fairly loud. Uh, we do have some folks who still have some challenges with this. You know, those who paid higher asked about the opportunity to partner. We, you know, uh, the words were, are you leaving money on the table? If you're now getting $100,000 from me and now you only want a membership of 20000 then I'm only going to budget 20000 and the organization may be missing out on some money. Um, those at the bottom end where their budgets can't manage that, are saying, you know, the opposite. Hey, that's way too much, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to do it at that level. Um, as you have heard, you know, through your uh, conversations with folks, the platinum and gold members believe their primary benefits were their multiplier in the voting. And we heard very loudly from mostly our corporate our corporate partners who have said, you know, large nonprofits should take what a corporation does because they can afford to do so. And, and they should. Um, global host, these next two points really have to deal with IASA 2.0, which I heard you all are talking about, and I know we're thinking about that a lot at, at ISOC. Um, those global host partners who have those uh, platinum and gold memberships, they have an agreement through some of them running all the way out to 2025, 2025. Um, they want to know how this thing translates. And they're right. We should have a one-to-one -one mapping of how this thing actually translates for each one of them that's individual. But I think you all would agree that some of that also is dependent upon ISA 2.0 and what happens there. And we want to be comfortable and ready to do kind of both sides of that. If ISA 2.0 doesn't happen in this year, 2018, which you know, sounds like it will, what are we going to do and how do we map that? If it does, we, we probably have some work to do there. Uh, and I know we do. And then those that pay very small amounts, they have, uh, we, what we've heard from people is those that pay very small amounts, you know, they could gang up or they could 
somebody could buy in with multiple memberships and have an a, have a, a impact on the governance with a very small fee. And we've kind of tossed that around and, and we kind of see what their, their conversation is. You know, the risk of such might be very low, but I think we have a plan to, to address that as well. So quickly some financials for you and, and thank you to Sandy and her team for helping me get this stuff. So this is uh, our year to date revenue just through Q2 and the percentages are of the Q2 budget uh, through Q2 budget. So first half, I guess is the way to look at that. And you can see where we are. Uh, memberships, grants and contributions, corporate partners, event sponsorships here. Um, in all cases, you will see we're lagging a bit behind, um, but not from lack of trying and working and all that. And you'll see on the next slide that we have some things in the pipeline that I think will come to shore this up very quickly. I did want to point out that this doesn't include anything that's been raised for IETF, NDSS, or PIR funds. So this is just about the pieces that the partnership development team is responsible for. And also point out for you always to keep in mind that we have had $170,000 of platinum membership money di uh, directed away from their membership. And, and a full 100000 100, was away from ISOC programs and to, to things outside of our our, uh, our scope of program. So you take that 170 and add it back into that 694 and you see we're, we're a bit closer to budget than, than what this shows. Um, but this is the exciting part for me because this is the part where what we're talking about in the marketplace as it were is starting to bear some fruit. So over 90 organizations in a prospect stage uh, most of those in proposal stage. We have several stages we use as we look at our pipeline. Um, membership, corporate partnerships, you can see that, you know, you add in some of these things and you start to see that we're really closer, but we need to sign them. We need to get the signature on the contract. AFPIF is doing very well for us. We're, we're very uh, excited about the opportunities for that big event in Africa. And then the fellowship uh, stuff that we have going on for IETF, we also see some pretty good traction on that. And just my notes here, just to keep you all in mind that uh, we have a, a second full-time fundraiser coming on June 18th, who will be based in the UK uh, to work on EMEA. So we've got more coming and, and more opportunity here, and I'm very excited about that. So get to cut to the chase. That was the update. So Todd, Todd I, I think Desiree, Desiree had a question on the previous slide. So Desiree, please go ahead. Yes, I didn't know I could wait until the end or ask now. I just would like to know if you want to now. Go ahead. Um, yes, please. What is the concept of corporate partnership? The, the idea of the corporate partnership was that there are some people who are, we are approaching or we'll talk to them about membership and that they will say, you know, I'm not really ready for a membership, but this thing you have going on in IoT campaigns, that's very interesting to me. Can I, can I help with that? Can I uh, give some uh, money or con contribute in a way that doesn't put me into a membership, but it does give me the opportunity to donate? We're seeing, I used IoT, I shouldn't have. I should use community networks because that's where we're seeing most of this right now. And some of it could be gift in kind in terms of, of equipment for a community network project in one of our three flagship uh, deployments. So we're looking at that. We, we've named it corporate partnership because it's not truly a membership, um, but you could think of it more as a contribution to a particular program. And it's different than the, um, the sponsorship and grants and contributions. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So when we think of sponsorships, we're thinking events, a particular event that they are going to sponsor and they'll get some no, uh, some notoriety during that or a fellowship being contributing towards sending someone to an actual event somewhere. So yeah, that's the difference there. And our budget is broken out like this too, Desiree, uh, as we work through these things. So we have these buckets that we're working for. Uh, working yeah, for. just trying to get my head around what, um, sure. what it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the proposal to cut to the chase. Um, we think with all of the data that we have gathered from folks, we believe that there is a general consensus that there is time for some change here and that it should be phased in over time. You can't do this big bang. There are some changes that have to be made. So proposal number one is that we move forward with the phased in approach as I talked to you about in March uh, in London, 
that we would uh, set all this up to be with their contractual 2019 renewal and then their which then puts their uh, voting pieces in place for the 2020 election impact. Uh, on our global host, um, we have an agreement with these folks, and some of them through 2025. We, we have to honor those agreements. So whatever is in those agreements, that's what we would do. And again, we need to do a one-to-one -one mapping for them with specifically stating that 20,000 will go to membership and the balance uh, of whatever their membership is at that time to the program of their choice, just like they have now. Uh, in the interim from the 2020 elections until their contract terminates, we would let their votes go to 3x instead of 6x uh, platinum as, as those folks have now. And that would be through their contractual term. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll point out that the asterisk is IASA 2.0 has impact on all of this. And I think that with the global host agreements, there is probably going to be a need uh, to be a renegotiation with the IETF LLC, LLC once that is in place. Um, I think that the IETF, at least what I'm hearing, IETF is thinking the same. They're thinking from the IASA 2.0 point of view that these contracts would need to be renegotiated somehow. I will say just, um, you know, I think that that needs to be looked at once we get there. Um, all other full members, their votes go to 1x starting with their 2019 renewal, as we've talked about, plus all of these other benefits. Uh, I think it was fair enough uh, what folks were saying that large nonprofits, and I'm using the definition for large nonprofits from uh, a noted, uh, the American Society of Association Executives has these buckets for how, how what size a membership organization or an association nonprofit is. If their turnover is 20 million a year, they call them large. Um, that we should work with them to pay as a corporation does. Um, this next point on the top on the right hand would be what's different for these um, memberships below $5,000, and that is to create a non-voting membership. They receive the benefit, they receive the opportunity to be in our community and to have input and all of that, but they would not get, uh, member, uh, not get voting rights. I think that that would um, set us up in a way that we could do several things with that. We could continue to have our diversity. We could also have the opportunity for those people who would be at a higher level uh, money-wise to have a chance to come in and be a part of our organization and see the work that we're doing, have a bit of contribution in, in terms of money, and then get to have a what we would call here in the U.S. the try before you buy type thing, um, before you go up to that higher level where you do have governance capabilities and all that, that it would be a way to dip your toe in the water as it were. Uh, we would still do some of the discounting factors, although we would reduce the tiers and we're working on what that would look like, you know, the, the dollars themselves and what the discounting would be. Um, for those who want to spend more money uh, in that corporate partnership realm, as, as Desiree was asking about, we would create a menu of partnering and we've got the start of that. You've seen that in other presentations, but we would, um, in our marketing materials, bet that out better. And then again, ISA 2.0 has some impact on all of this and I look forward to, to working with those folks once that's ready. So, to so Todd, be, before we move to the next um, slide, mm -hmm. so on the, on the non-voting membership, um, don't we have the risk that, I mean, if a non-voting membership provides basically all the benefits except the, the governance uh, for much lower money that, you know, some organization are actually interested in this and, and they basically take that instead of the other or your conversations don't show this problem? Yeah, our conversations bear out that, that really what folks are interested in, they, they are interested in the benefits. They want to be involved. They want to have this information and all that. And, and could there be a risk over time of people saying, well, I just want to pay $5,000 so that I can have all of these benefits. I think it's pretty small, but I, there could be there. I, I won't tell you that, that they wouldn't. Um, but we do have a, a good segment of our, our folks who say, you know, I'm interested. I'm here for the governance. I'm here to also yeah. have an input into who's on the board and the direction of the Internet Society. And we've seen that. So, um, I, I, I think Kathy wants to chime in on yeah, that. Yeah, Kathy wants to, yeah. So I, just, I think this also becomes a strategy for our developing world um, a push to bring new people in, that it would be a way to get uh, uh, more corporate 
uh, activity in the rest of the world. Uh, now, depending how large they are, maybe this, you would still pitch them on a voting right. But if it's a, a smaller uh, person, maybe you would go this way. But I hear what you're saying, that it could result in the opposite incentive. So I think it would have to be closely watched. But that was part of the thing. OK, good. Um, any other questions? I had John in the queue and then Desiree, so John. Yeah, I, I, I guess I have kind of the, fl the flip question, which is by, by flattening the membership um, categories, you know, and drop, dropping what the plat current platinum and gold members pay, we're kind of leaving a million dollars on the table. And I'm wondering how much of that do you see coming back through partnerships and other stuff? John, I, I think the first thing to say there is that if you look at those who are paying the $100,000, primarily ma the majority of them are support of the IETF, that their monies are going to the IETF. And it is my distinct feeling that once IASA 2.0 comes about, what I know of it today, and I know you all are working through that, if the opportunity or if the request is that those checks are written directly to the IETF and not through ISOC, we're going to lose that million dollars anyway from an ISOC perspective. It's going to go directly to the IETF. My job and what I've been thinking here is how do I bring that back up for the support of the, of the Internet Society itself? And I think that, that in those cases, we're not talking about people who are going to come to the table with $100,000 at a time. They're going to come with $20,000. You know, big companies are going to come with that twenty fifteen dollars to $20,000 and if they want to spend money on other things or do gifts in kind and all that for our programs, we have an opportunity for them to do that in our corporate sponsorships. So I'm, I'm really reacting to the market on this. I think that if all things were equal, I completely agree with you. But with IASA 2.0 and the opportunity to give their money directly to IETF, I, I don't think that we're, I think we're going to lose that money anyway. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. I mean, I have to say that the, what I've seen, what I've seen in IASA too, well, there's sort of a placeholder. That, yeah, we'll have some sort of, some sort of organizational fundraising thing, and nobody, except maybe Alyssa, nobody even thought about it yet. But uh, I'll make sure we keep it in mind. Yeah, do because uh, what I'm hearing back is like uh, I can't call the name of the person who's actually now working on fundraising there, but the question has come up: Should we be renegotiating these global host agreements and these bigger agreements that that are? putting direct money into IETF through ISOC? I think it's all a reasonable question, but if so, that's where the money will go and we're working on trying to build it back up. We know Gonzalo's wearing three hats here, so what do you think? <laughs> so I, I think exactly as, as what Todd was saying, actually, and I, I talked to him about that, that um, I, as I have said many times, I mean, the, the, the parts of a large organization paying for ISOC, they are different than the parts of the large organization paying for the IETF. And at this point, I have the feeling that if you look at, you know, who are writing the checks, like Jason, myself, um, you know, those guys, we, we are kind of closer to the ITF side of things. So in, in that sense, I fully agree with um, Todd's analysis. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that the ITF has very, has very expensive membership levels for you. I mean, we, as, as Todd said, I mean, they are, they are talking to us in terms of, you know, renegotiating the global host agreement. So in that sense, I'm already working on, on that with them. So, so okay. they, they are doing that. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, Desiree, please. Thank you. Uh, so just trying to um, understand when would be the cutoff date? I can see, um, Todd, you propose a phased approach in 2019 renewals and 2020 for the election impact. Uh, when would be this, when do you expect this change of the fee structure would actually take place next year? Yes, it would take place with our, as we go to each of these and as their renewals, because they're not all in one time frame. you know, it's when they came in and we do these on one year contracts. So as their renewals come up in 2019, um, before that, well, just step back, Desiree, we would actually start talking to people beforehand, what it looks like so they can budget appropriately. That was the reason to do it in the 2019 renewal is so that they would have full full transparency of what we would we would be asking them so that they can budget appropriately for their 2019 budget. But then we would do we would do the transaction through the 2019 renewal, the financial transaction. <clears throat> We're delivering the benefits right now and, and started doing that work as of you know uh, March or so. 
Yeah. Um, so the, tra the financial transaction would be there, which would then impact the elections at the end of 2019, which obviously are the 2020 uh, board, uh, seated board. Thank you. And um, so I'm thinking along the same lines as uh, a little bit of a concern perhaps for cutting down the platinum fee and maybe trying to see whether when the IAS administrative uh, body is set up, whether we still have platinum members continuing to pay because uh, in my account, we may lose um, three of those, Ericsson and so on, not to name all the organizations um, that may jump to the IASA 2.0 structure, but we may still withhold some of the original platinum members. So I wonder if a phased approach there would be, uh, if some delay would also take place or whether that would impact your plans of changing the global, the whole structure. I wonder what your thoughts on that would be. Well, what the data tells me is, is that half of those platinum members are global host um, companies as well. So they're tied to this ISA 2.0 thing. The other four, because uh, there's nine total uh, platinum members, the other four we've been talking to about this, and they still have interest in supporting programs of the Internet Society. So, and again, talking about it is different from signing the check, as John was pointing out at that time. I believe that the other four that aren't global host and aren't, you know, very transparently tied to the IETF, um, and, and the one I'm thinking of off the top of my mind is London Trust Media, who uh, is just taking a position on our our, uh, our OMAC uh, committee, the the two chairs. Um, you know, their interest in still supporting the Internet Society is is strong. And what we will, our conversations with them is $20,000 for membership and you'll let me put $80,000 if I still want to do 100,000 to some program, we think that's reasonable. So I think we're, we're still fine. If we get to that point and I ask the 2.0 isn't fully baked, um, I, I concur with you, Desiree, we'll need to have a look at that and, and see. But like I said, five out of those members have contracts already. We would have to do, we'd have to, um, uh, we'd have to continue those contracts and do a one-to-one -one, um, mapping for them. Mm, thank you. So that means, yeah, there's a risk of $400,000 being um, left. Yeah, I, I, I hear, yeah, I mean, there's a small risk there, but I, I think with the four we're talking about that they are, the, the, the small, the risk is small. And um, would those um, members from all tiers be able to earmark anything towards the programs or would they just get say just membership benefits without earmarking any of their contribution to a particular ISOC program? Is that so, why you're creating a corporate partnership or? That's exactly why we're creating corporate partnerships. So their membership fee would be their membership fee and they would not have an opportunity of that fee to earmark towards anything. Mm -hmm. okay. But if they yeah. did have monies that they wanted to put to that, we have a menu, a range of things that we can work with them. And I think we're already seeing some of that, as I stated with community, you know, conversation with Nokia about how they would like to contribute uh, equipment to the community networks uh, campaign. So we're already seeing some of that start to work and giving them that flexibility from a menu of things. And so far, with with new folks it's it's um well received yeah my worry last thing last comment is that a smaller organizational members that pay 2.5 thousand us dollars per annum um would actually now have a higher barrier of entry and um and I would think that you would like to also uh, con have another meeting where you would create a, and, and, and discuss this uh, non-voting membership um, proposition with them directly, because I would like to think we'd like to improve the diversity of small and medium entrepreneurship and small businesses rather than raise the barrier. And, and I concur with you 100%. And that's why we thought about doing it this way in terms of, you know, maybe it still is $2,500. Maybe it is $2,500. Their membership stays the same. Just this, this below $5,000 saying, you know, we're going to deliver you benefits. 
and what we've heard from them is the, the voting, and, and you can see from their voting track record, some of those smaller ones are not doing the voting part, but they are contributing and, and being a part of our diverse and, and a diverse organization and giving us legitimacy as well. So that's why we took a look at, can we do something down here that would keep those folks in, but would guard against someone going out and buying 20 of these things uh, Twenty-two thousand dollar memberships to try to get a bunch of votes on the board, which is what some of the the fear was from some of the other members. Low risk again, very low risk of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, just so the, the last yeah. slide was. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Just the last slide was to kind of talk about how we would go about doing this. So I think we've you know over the couple of last couple of meetings we've talked about how we get there. This just gives the steps in, in no order with uh, no particular dates assigned, but we still believe that there should be a resolution for the board of support of this program. Um, even though there's only one document that talks about the voting rights, which is the process document, um, which we would set up the resolution and all that for, if you agree to be um, done at the meeting in Panama. Uh, and then you can see the rest here, completing our marketing, continue our recruiting efforts, notifying all members, talking with them that this is what we want to do for the 2019 renewal. We would complete our roll, uh, rollout of benefits. I think the, the piece that we're working on now is our working groups, uh, the OTA type working groups and, and spreading that across um, the OMAC as well. Um, ISA2O, I want to you know, continue to be very clear that this is something we're keeping our eye on and we stand ready to assist as soon as IETF is ready for us to do so in whatever format that looks like. We'd run our 2019 Board of Trustee elections as always with the vote multipliers just like they are from 2018 membership and renewals. And then 2020, this would, uh, the 2020 election is when this would take, uh, take effect. I think I went over 15 minutes. I apologize for that, but great questions and I appreciate the opportunity. Excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so um, well, we need a resolution. Let's let's uh, start discussions within the board, and, and let's see if we are ready by Panama or or you know we we pass it at, at you know a later point. But uh, anyway, let's 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 start a discussion right now with I mean the material that Todd has presented and his previous presentations, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Excellent. Thank you, Todd. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So now um, the last um, point in the agenda is any other business. Do we have any other business? Okay, seeing none, then I move to adjourn. Adjourn the formal meeting. Yeah, thank you. So Kevin can stop the recording now.